Welcome everyone, I'm Mary Thompson, and today we're going to be talking about cash strategies in turbulent times. And joining us in this conversation is Paul Deere, who is a vice president, wealth private client for Empower. We're gonna to get to Paul in just a moment, but first a couple of housekeeping items. If you have a question for Paul during this conversation, please put it in the chat function. We're gonna be monitoring that and we'll get to as many questions as we can today. Second, we do have a poll for you, basically asking why do you have cash in your portfolio? It's a multiple choice answer and we'd appreciate you taking that poll. We're gonna have the results of that later in this conversation. So without any further ado, we wanna welcome Paul. We're so glad you're joining us today. Thank you for having me, very happy to be here. You know, the first question I have for you is there's been um, a number of, there's been a lot of questions about this traditional 60-40 structure that you have in a retirement portfolio, 60% stock, 40% bonds, and whether that really is the smartest thing to, or the smartest way to structure a portfolio in this interest rate environment. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Is this still relevant or not? Yeah. Uh, we, we certainly still have a lot of conviction behind the benefits of a diversified blend of stocks and bonds, which is the breakdown you reference at 60-40. But your question is particularly timely, just due to the somewhat challenging results that 60-40 portfolios over the past two years have seen. In particular, in 2022, that was a really abnormal year because both stocks and bonds declined simultaneously. Um, and bonds in particular did particularly poorly. Um, the typical advantage of a diversified portfolio is that when some assets decline, others tend to rise. And we really didn't see that in 2022, which prompts your question, is it still a smart approach? Now, despite the abnormal recent results, there are plenty of decades of historical market returns that show that 60-40 works despite the occasional outlier events that it can occur, like what happened in 2022. There have been other events in the past 50 years where you could point to similar outlier events. Um, and further, you know, when you are comparing, since we're here to talk about cash, when you're comparing a 60-40 portfolio to cash, there are substantially higher expected returns over time from a 60-40 portfolio than you'd expect to receive in keeping your assets in cash, particular as you, particularly as you look out over multiple years. Okay. Just one question before we went to the questions from the audience, which are already uh, rolling in. You know, what have you seen as far as cash allocation within your client um, base over the last year? How has it changed? Because this, for many people, is um, the best rate environment they've seen in their lifetimes. Yeah, we actually get some really unique insights into investors' habits through our Empower personal dashboard, which allows individuals to see and understand their financial circumstances in a consolidated view. And through that, we've actually seen the users of our dashboard, their median cash allocation has increased by about 15% year over year to a average amount of about $67,000. And what's been interesting to see in addition to that is that that amount represents more than 26% of our users' overall portfolios. Um, as to why, uh, I would say over the course of this year, there's been a fair amount of negative economic sentiment from investors, likely causing some to shy away from investing in stocks and bonds. And I mean, let, let's face it, you're, you're probably more likely and willing to take a guaranteed, say, 5% return against uncertain market returns, particularly over a short period of time. And with cash at certain institutions earning around a 5% return, that's a pretty, pretty favorable rate to get on a guaranteed basis. Great. Well, 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 this is a nice segue. That's a nice segue, actually, to our question from the audience. Um, would it be safer to choose a local brick and mortar bank? or an online bank for a high interest rate savings account or a CD? Yeah, um, well, I think that question may be a little bit targeted towards some of the regional bank failures that occurred recently. Um, and we actually did a little bit of a study on that as well. And we found little impact from the regional bank failures on investors' cash balances. Um, it really seems like investors largely shrugged off the events uh, as shown by some of the increased cash balances that I just mentioned. 
This was really likely a result of the stability provided by the federal government as they insured depositors at the banks that did fail in amounts that were typically beyond what is covered by FDIC insurance. But to address the question more directly, you know, ultimately there is FDIC insurance in many banks and institutions. And what you might find is that certain institutions may be able to offer a higher level of FDIC insurance coverage, which may influence your decision on where to park your cash. Um, I think, you know, high yield savings accounts in particular, we have one in Power Personal Cash. It can provide up to $5 million in FDIC coverage in addition to providing a interest rate, an annualized interest rate that is pretty close to 5%. So ultimately looking at what is available to you and understanding what your needs and objectives are is probably your starting point, but maximizing the interest rate that you're earning in cash and making sure that you've got the right amount of coverage on that cash is our two main major focuses. Okay. And another question from the audience, is it still wise to ladder CDs for three, six, and nine months or just go for a 12 and 18 month now, um, again, in, the, in this environment? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that really pertains, it, the answer really depends on what you think the Fed is going to do over the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, currently, the Fed just recently paused further rate increases, the probability of interest rates declining seems to be higher than it was six months ago. And so if you think that interest rates are going to be going down from here, the typical laddering approach may not be to your advantage. But that's really more of a question of timing. Um, and some individuals may be more comfortable with making those bigger timing based decisions than others. A more conservative approach would be to continue uh, laddering just in case the Fed has to continue to rise and uh, raise interest rates. Okay. We have um, a question again, talking, asking about the safety of cash. Is it still safe in quotes um, to hold cash? As this, um, this participant says, they get several emails a day regarding how cash will be changing. Not quite sure what that means, but, you know, from where you sit, are there, are there new risks emerging in the, in the cash market? Sure. Well, I think I think you got to everything is relative. So you got to think about what are your other options if it's not cash. And when you think about cash relative to most typical other investment options, cash is going to be the most liquid. It's typically going to be the safest. I think some of those regional bank failures may have put a little bit of a finer point on how safe things are out there in cash. And that really just points to if you want the ultimate amount of safety, FDIC insurance is really what you want to be focused in on to make sure that you're within the coverage amounts. Um, I'm trying to think of what else that that question could be pointing to. I, I, the only other thing I would comment on that question around the safety of cash, and I don't think we've talked about it here yet, is opportunity cost. There are two major considerations when you're keeping your money in cash. One, what is the prevalent um, loss of buying power that you're going to see as a result of inflation out there. Keeping your money in cash may feel good, but if you're ultimately unable to buy as much with that cash in a year from now, you've actually lost out. Uh, and further, opportunity cost also pertains to what you could be doing with that cash otherwise. So keeping a very large balance in cash that you don't need for some kind of a short-term expenditure may actually be putting less money in your pocket than more. All right, great. How about this question? Please advise CD or treasury bonds, pros and cons. CD or treasury bonds, again, I think it comes to preference and duration. Uh, treasury bonds can come in a number of different maturity levels, anywhere from a year to 30. So depending on how long you want there, you might find a CD is more typically going to be one to five years. So duration is important. Um, Treasury bonds also to be, excuse me, treasury bonds are also considered some of the most risk-free assets out there. So I think at the point where you are considering a CD or a treasury bond from the federal government, it really comes down to what is the interest rate that you're going to be earning between the two. The level of safety between the two is likely fairly similar depending on the type of CD that you're purchasing. Some CDs uh, are not FDIC insured, so definitely want to look out for that. Okay. Speaking of interest rates and where they're headed, one of 
our participants is asking if rates are going to go down next year, is it time to start putting money to work in a high dividend ETF? If rates are going to go down, should you be putting your money into a high dividend ETF? Yeah. Potentially, I think our general advice would be to be a little bit more diversified than focusing in on those certain more um, targeted assets. And the reason being, though, currently it does seem reasonable to expect that interest rates will be going down. That is not a certainty. And in many cases, the market will usually quickly price in forward looking expectations. So you really want to be prepared for surprises. So there might be some uh, benefit to having a little bit in something like that, but I wouldn't go full bore into it. Okay, what about non-callable CDs? One of our participants is asking, is it generally better to buy a non-callable CD or a bond, even though the rates may be slightly lower? Yeah, I think that points back to the other question that we received, which is more a question of timing. Um, a non-callable CD is a CD that you would purchase, which basically has a promise that you would receive the interest payment for the duration without getting the interest payment um, or the CD called early. Um, and that's just a reinvestment risk concern. So if we are in fact seeing that interest rates have peaked, buying a non-callable CD would be certainly better than a regular CD, which could potentially be called away earlier. Um, so it, it really depends on how much conviction do you have on where rates are going here over the next couple of years. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, an investor might structure their portfolio. You know, what is your advice to savers um, on figuring out how much cash they should have in their portfolio? Yeah, um, I, I would start by saying investors really want to consider a systematic way to keep their cash at the right amount. Uh, I'm a big believer that sticking to a specific plan is key so that you don't have to overcome friction of taking action and you can avoid emotionally based decisions, be it fear or greed, uh, when it comes to holding more or less cash on hand. I also think you know, your style of investing may inform this quite a bit as well. As an active investor may make more meaningful adjustments to their cash balances over time as we've received several questions that are pertaining to, well, I think that interest rates may be going down. That's a more active based decision process, whereas passive investors may tend to have a more stable cash target despite their near term or medium term market expectations. So really just having your cash at the right amount is is the best thing to do. And to do that, you need to have a process established that you can clearly, and in my opinion, emotionlessly follow. What are some of the, the elements of that process? Is it time? Is it kind of self-assessed risk? What are some of the things people should be considering for that process? Yeah, absolutely. Your time horizon is critical, as is your comfort with risk. Risk tolerance, time horizon, and your ability to withstand or ride through losses are all pretty critical components. And when I say that last one, your overall net worth and how much you plan to need from the portfolio are things that you need to consider in order to determine how much cash you might want on hand. So two just general examples, if you're a individual who's in your 60s or 70s, you're retired, you might have a higher cash balance than someone who is, say, in their 30s and accumulating assets, right? Because you may be using more of the assets in your portfolio more frequently than someone who's in a savings mode. Um, as another example, if you are in your 20s and you're trying to put a down or you save for a down payment on your first home, your current focus might be purchasing that house versus accumulating a retirement portfolio. And that would be a key reason why you might hold more cash. Uh, than someone who's, say, in their 30s, as another example. Okay, now that you have, you've outlined basically what an individual should can be considers from their own perspective when determining how much cash there should be, what do you say to them as far as what, are, what the economic indicators, market trends they should be watching that might also influence how they, you know, how much money they put into cash at a certain time? Yep, well, we've talked about one pretty key indicator several times already, which is the Fed and what they are doing with interest rates. 
Um, and then I think the rest comes down to whether or not you are an active market participant or you're more of a passive investor and focusing in on what your specific goals and objectives are over the next three, five, and then 10 plus year periods. We have a question from the audience. Um, one participant asking, is now a good time to consider REITs given that rates may, may be at a high point? Now, that's a really interesting question. So if you're purchasing into REITs now, theoretically, what you're assuming is that because interest rates are as high as they are, the value of REITs are low to down um, and, and we may be at the, an inflection point. I, my answer to that question would be that REITs are an important element of a diversified portfolio and certainly can provide a lot of potential benefit in a rocky market environment. Um, but overly exposing yourself to REITs right now could, ver could be a little, little risky simply based on the fact that commercial buildings have also gotten a lot of interest and attention over the past several years as a result of what's happened during the pandemic. Uh, and there are a lot of commercial entities that are sitting on buildings that are largely empty. Uh, and it remains to be seen if those commercial entities can continue to pay uh, their mortgages on those buildings as a result of the low rents that have occurred in some of these um, more concentrated cities, I would say. Okay. And while we're talking cash, we do have a question about gold, though, uh, coming across our wire asking, should we also own gold? You know, I know there have been a traditional thought of five to 10% in your portfolio um, mm -hmm. in the precious metals. Love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, uh, I would, I would kind of lump gold in with REITs in that we kind of consider REITs and gold as investment alternatives to stocks and bonds. And the reason that we consider them alternatives is they tend to be less positively or in fact negatively correlated with stocks and bonds, which can be a real benefit to have some exposure to things like gold or REITs when stocks or bonds decline in value. So part of a well-constructed diversified portfolio is having multiple asset classes that all perform differently over different market environments. And gold is absolutely one of those precious metals that tends to perform as a little bit of a safety hedge against uh, economic downturns. Great. But Talk I would also yeah. caution, I'll just add this, if you look at the performance of gold over multiple decades, it typically doesn't do anywhere near the same level of returns as the stock markets. Okay, good to keep in mind. Are there ways or is there a way for savers to maximize the potential of their cash holdings? Back to cash now. How yeah. can they maximize it? Yeah, a great first starting point is understanding what where you're parking your cash and what interest rate you are achieving on that cash. There's actually a very large dispersion in what banks and high yield savings accounts are paying out there today. And despite the Fed having raised interest rates very significantly over the past two years, there are still some very large banks out there that are offering interest rates that are in the fractions of a percent. Um, and so just best thing you can do is understand what is your cash earning you today? Is there a better option out there? And also, do you have the right amount of cash on hand? Just going back to some of my prior talking points. And how about the tax implications of holding holding cash? What are some of the things that people should investors should be considering, you know, when they buy a CD or invest in a high yield money market fund? Yeah, well, that's a that's kind of a amusing question because over the last decade with interest rates where they've been, which was extremely low, I think most investors haven't really wor worried at all about tax implications of earning interest on their balances because the amounts have been so de minimis. Uh, now, however, with interest rates out there that might be paying you around 5% annually, now you're probably going to have to pay some tax amount on that. There are certainly tax-free uh, products out there and available. Those can sound very appealing as a result of the term tax-free, but to really understand whether or not that is to your advantage, you have to take a closer look at what your specific tax rate is and do a comparison to understand uh, whether or not the tax-free rate is 
paying you just as much as you would receive after taxes on a non-tax free rate. Okay. Just a reminder to our audience, if you do have a question for Paul, uh, please put it in the chat function and we'll get to it as we only have a few minutes left with him. Um, but Paul, I want to ask you as well, and I guess I think this is a continuation of it, something we mentioned earlier, but in light of what happened earlier this year with the regional banks as well, how should investors think about spreading their cash among different institutions, if at all? I know obviously you look at certain levels, but is should that be part of someone's strategy as well? Yeah, I'm there. FDIC insurance is there for a very specific reason. It is there to give uh, depositors confidence in the banking system. And if you are putting a substantial amount of money uh, with any one financial institution uh, in cash, you should be considerate of whether or not you are above or below the FDIC uh, coverage amounts. Now, what was interesting about those regional bank failures is that the federal government did decide to pay out depositors beyond the guaranteed FDIC coverage amount. That was highly unusual. And I think investors should not expect that to be the case should it happen again in the future. So when you look at financial institutions, understanding how much money you have with any one bank is key. And also understand that not all institutions are necessary or places you deposit your cash are necessarily equal. While a single bank account may offer you $250,000 in FDIC coverage, there are products out there like our Empower Personal Cash product, which can offer up to $5 million in FDIC coverage through the way that the program is structured. So definitely critical to understand it. Um, and it really just comes down to, do you have enough cash on hand uh, to need to worry about it? Okay, we did actually have some uh, some poll results that I wanted to share with you and get your reaction. So, you know, what? Do, why do you keep, the question was, why do you keep cash in your portfolio? Um, the number of people answering liquidity for future expenses is 44.1%. Dry powder um, is, let me see, that was the second most popular answer at 41.2% part due to discomfort with the markets, 11.8%. Is that anything unusual or noteworthy in those results that, that you've seen over the last year? No, I think that, that fits with what I would expect. There's about 50% of respondents who ultimately are saying, I, I have the cash on hand for something other than investing. And the other 50% are saying effectively, I'm waiting for the right moment to deploy my cash. And that really, to me, speaks to the dynamic between a passive and an active investor, which I've always traditionally viewed as about a 50-50 split there. You know, go to a party, 100 people, you talk to them all about investments. That's what I do every day. And um, about, I think about 50 people would say they're more active and about 50 would say they're more passive. Well, Paul, we're very happy that you joined us today to talk about these investments. Thank you so much for your time.